Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the topics that's discussed in On the Ends Book 1 by Torquatus as the representative of the Epicurean position is what the Epicureans make of friendship. This was an incredibly important topic in ancient times, just as much as it is in the present. It probably will be for human beings so long as we are distinctively human. And one of the big worries and indeed criticisms about the Epicurean views on pleasure were its implications for friendship. Here's sort of the worries in a nutshell. If what human beings are fundamentally motivated by as their final end or greatest good is pleasure, then doesn't that reduce personal relationships like that of friendship, which should involve loving the other person for their own sake? Doesn't that reduce that relationship down to a matter of pleasure? So one of the concerns would be, I don't really love my friend for who he or she is. I really love them insofar as they have a capacity to give me pleasure. So it seems more selfish. It seems more contingent. When they stop giving me pleasure, I will no longer be friends with them. And I won't make friends with people who might be deserving of my friendship if I don't find them pleasant to be around. So this is a very big concern. And Torquata says, listen, the Epicurean position on this is pretty clear. Epicurus himself, by not only what he said, but also by what he did, his own personal example carried out through the course of his life, showed that it is certainly possible for an Epicurean, uh, indeed he is the first Epicurean, to have friendships, to sustain friendships, and to value them for what they are. So he says, Epicurus's pronouncement about friendship is that of all the means to happiness that wisdom has devised, none is greater, none more fruitful, none more delightful than friendship. So clearly friendship is at the center of the good life, the life of happiness, as Epicureans conceive of it. He goes on, Torquatus, and says, not only did he commend this by his eloquence, but by the example of his life. So what did Epicurus do? If you don't know, Epicurus gathered his friends around him, and he bought a plot of land, which he called the garden. This is why the Epicurean school is called the garden. And he set aside funds and you know, made it a place that would continue on after his death. He even had a will about it. He set things in place so that his friends would continue to enjoy a life of pleasure even after he was gone. So clearly, by his own example, he shows that friendship is indeed a central value. Now, he says, to return to our subject, because we don't have to look at personal instances, I notice that Epicureans have treated this topic of friendship in three main ways. So the first way is to say that friendship really is, in some respect, about pleasure, and it's not disinterested, and we do, in fact, value our own pleasure more than we do the, the pleasure of our friends, but it all works out because we're rational creatures, and therefore, from an Epicurean perspective, you know, we do in fact value friendship, but it is coming from an egoistic perspective. The second position says that 
friendship begins from that basis, but eventually it changes. It transforms into a relation in which I do value the other person's outcomes, happiness, pleasures, just as much as I value my own. And the third position, which he doesn't explain quite as much, is that the wise have made some sort of agreement or pact to value each other and their friendship no less uh, to value each other's friendship and, and, and uh, pleasures no less than they do their own. So he spends more time talking about the first one, and he lays out some typical Epicurean doctrines drawn from, in, in part, Epicurus's principal uh, doctrines or sayings. So he says, um, there we go. This doctrine that we don't actually desire our friend's pleasure as much as we desire our own has been thought by some critics to undermine the very foundations of friendship. Why would it be thought to do so? Because if I value my own pleasure more, my own outcomes more, my own happiness more, then what's to prevent me from cutting my friend loose whenever they're not really useful for me or pleasant to me? So there are some answers to this that the Epicureans gave. He said, friendship cannot be separated from pleasure. Why? A solitary, friendless life must be beset by secret dangers and alarms. What does this mean? When we're by ourselves, one of the things that's bad about being alone is that we are more vulnerable to whatever is going to happen to us. If we have a friend, they can at least be by our side when we're going through something difficult, or they might be able to help. And if you think about the nature of friendships, quite often people are friends with other people who have skills, talents, resources that they themselves do not possess precisely so that when they need to call on that person, that person will help them out. Think about how useful having a plumber as a friend would be if you own a house or rent an apartment. So he goes on and he says, that's one reason. So reason advises the acquisition of friends. Their possession gives you confidence and a firmly rooted hope of winning pleasure. He also says, just as hatred, jealousy, and contempt felt by other people towards us are hindrances to pleasure, so friendship is the most trustworthy preserver and also creator of pleasure for our friends and for ourselves. Being in a friendship gives you a better chance of getting to enjoy pleasures, or if you're already enjoying pleasures, continuing to enjoy them. Think about calling up your friends to watch the game, right? It's fun to watch the game if you're into that sort of thing, but it's more fun when you've got friends to watch it with, provided they're not you know, irritating or uh, perhaps too invested in, in the outcome of the game. But it's a way of assuring yourself a greater amount of happiness in this life. So he goes on and he says, it, enjoy, it, it affords us enjoyment in the pleasant. <laughs> it affords us enjoyment in the present. And it inspires us with hopes for the near and distant future. So friendship is about what we actually have right now. But it's also a way of trying to provide some degree of freedom from the vulnerabilities that, that we incur and to assure ourselves that we're going to have some good enjoyment in the future. So that is one key way of treating friendship. It, it still remains self-centered, but it's self-centered in a rational way that, that realizes that if you're too self-centered, you can't actually enjoy this greatest good of friendship. So he says, we rejoice in our friend's joy as much as, as our own. We're equally pained by their sorrows. So the wise man, here's the upshot, the wise person will feel exactly the same towards his friend as he does towards himself. Why? Because it's rational to do so and will exert himself as much for his friend's pleasure as he would for his own. So it's a rational thing to do, even though on a, a core level, we don't actually love the friend first, we love ourselves first, and we desire our own pleasure first, to treat the friend as if the friend is another self. 
The second point of view is uh, called by Torquatus a little bit less bold, but in a certain respect, it goes even further. So he says that uh, these other Epicureans say that if we hold friendship to be desirable only for the pleasure it affords to ourselves, it will be thought it's crippled altogether. So they therefore say the first advances and overtures, the, the beginnings of friendship are in fact self-centered. They have to do with us getting pleasure. So you talk with somebody on the bus and maybe you're striking up a friendship. It's only going to really be a friendship if there's some sort of usefulness to you or some sort of pleasure coming out of that. If not, then you just forget it and you get off the bus and you never talk to that person again or until you see them again on the bus, right? But with time, that sort of friendship develops into something different. So the people who hold the second view, he says, um, here's, here's how it goes. When the progress of, of engagement or intercourse here, right, has led to some sort of connection or intimacy, then the relationship blossoms into an affection strong enough to make us love our friends for their own sake, even though no practical advantage results from their friendship. So over time, because of the kind of creatures that we are, we develop an affection for the friend for their own sake, not for our own sakes, not for just the pleasures that they afford us, but for the sake of the friend. And he gives examples here. He says, doesn't familiarity endear to us localities, cities, uh, playing grounds, horses and hounds, gladiatorial shows, fights with wild beasts. You might think in our own time about the affection that people feel for the people who they watch on television or in streaming video these days, or even in YouTube, people they've never met but they watch them and engage with them over and over again, enough to the point where they will defend their honor <laughs> and get very worked up about, you know, for example, in Game of Thrones, whether Tyrion is a good guy or a bad guy, or whether, you know, Daenerys should have used the dragons in this way or that way. People develop something like friendship in these sorts of cases. So why not the more so for people who we actually see face to face, people who we engage with day after day, that familiarity doesn't necessarily, as the proverb goes, have to breed contempt. It can breed genuine friendship instead. Now the third possibility, the third way of talking about friendship that the Epicureans take here isn't really sketched out so much, and it might to you resemble the first one. So we'll look at how these might be different. What he says here is, the third view is that wise people, the sapientes, those who, who actually know, those, the smart people, they make a kind of compact or agreement, or if you like, uh, a pact, a, a fuetus in, in Latin. This is a sort of agreement that's uh, enforced in some way, to love each other, to treat each other as equals, as another self. So he says uh, they've made a kind of compact to love their friends no less than themselves. And he says we can understand the possibility of this, and we often see it happen. No more effective means to happiness can be found than such an agreement or alliance. How is this different than the first way. Well, you could say that in this case, there's some sort of explicit agreement that is made almost contract, you know, in a contractual manner between the people engaged in the friendship. They lay things out, maybe a bit more informally than actually putting it on paper. And in this case, it's not so much about an agreement. It's rather what would be rational for you as a friend to do in relation to another person. So in this case, I give this condition of friendship, loving you just as much as you love me, just as much as, as I love myself as a condition of it. And I expect it from you. So there's a reciprocity here. In this case, uh, there is not necessarily such an expectation. So there is a difference between these different positions number one and number three. But in any case, 
These are three different viewpoints that the Epicureans did in fact work out, as we find discussed by Cicero, trying to respond to this problem that people were having with the Epicureans, saying that you people don't really value friendship as a good. You only value pleasure, so you're leaving something fundamentally important out.